coming. We are delighted you know, to have uh, with us uh, Professor Devra Mola. Uh, Professor Mola is very familiar to us. She is a former Canadian from the uh, government department here. Uh, and when she was here, she was uh, very active in IAD and was a member of our advisory uh, board in the Institute for African Development. So a very special welcome to you. For she holds a PhD from the uh, University of Michigan. Her research uh, focuses on uh, political communication, information, and participation with a focus on Africa. She is the author of the book, Distrusting Democrats, Outcomes of Participatory Constitution Making. In that book, she argues that participation in a new democracy can create citizens who are democratic in their attitudes, but suspicious of their government. So please join me in welcoming Professor Moore. Thank you very much for having me back here. I very much enjoyed the IAD seminar series when I was here at Cornell, learned a lot, and so it's a real honor to be invited back to talk with you guys. Um, and I'm presenting a work that's very much a work in progress. We got the full data set, um, gee, it would be about a month ago now. <laughs> uh, we had bits of it before then, but the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very new and it's uh, very unfinished. And so I'm really looking forward to getting some comments from you guys that might uh, help me push this forward a little bit. Um, the project looks at uh, the effect of pictures and party symbols and party names on ballots. And we look at how these things might affect vote outcomes. And we're interested in this because we think that there might be direct policy implications of how you design a ballot um, to best uh, further uh, voter choice and uh, democratic outcomes. But we also see it as a window into thinking about how it is that voters, in this case in Uganda, make decisions about who to vote for and what kinds of influences might be driving them towards one direction or another. So by looking at this topic about marking ballots, we also get an insight about decision making in, in elections more generally. Um, the project looks at both, as a whole, looks at both the pictures, the effect of pictures, and the effect of party symbols. Um, so far, we've only looked at the data for the party uh, influences, so I'm going to give you some data from that. But I'm going to start out by talking about the project more generally, why it is that we're doing what we're doing, what the background literature says, um, and uh, the research design for the project as a whole, why we chose Soroti County in Uganda, and how we designed the study. Um, and then I'm going to show you a a piece of the research on just the parties. So um, just to give you a little bit of background here, there's a wide variety in the kinds of information that appear on ballots. Um, so here we have from Hungary, the basic, uh, most basic, the sort of name of the candidate, and in this case, their party affiliation here. Um, but things can get more elaborate than that or less elaborate than that. Ballots vary considerably within the United States as well. Um, here the, from Maryland, you have the name of the candidate and their party, um, and you also have where they, what state they're from. Um, but you can see on the very same ballot, while there's partisan identification for president and other, and many of the candidates, when it comes to judges, there's no party, uh, this is a no party election. So party, partisan affiliation does not appear on the ballot for some uh, offices, or often it's judges and local uh, council officials and these kinds of things. And these decisions about whether or not judicial elections should be partisan or not are made differently in different locations in the United States. In the UK, uh, you also get to know exactly where they live. In Germany, in addition to knowing exactly where they live, you also get to know what their profession is. So, you know, this guy's a student. Right? You, all the students out there can vote for the student. In Trinidad and Tobago, they also include party symbol along with their address and their profession. Um, and the use of party symbols on ballots is more common in developing countries and lower um, places with, with uh, lower economic development and in new democracies or lack thereof and new electoral systems, I guess I should say. Um, 
The research, not by myself, but by Reynolds and Stinbergen, um, argue that, uh, or they, they do a, an empirical analysis and find that both symbols and party and pictures of candidates are more prevalent in less developed areas of the world. Um, sometimes the symbol is not of a party, but in this case it's a symbol uh, for the referendum in southern Sudan recently, whether they wanted unity or separation. So another kind of a symbol. And here, of course, the symbol is the most prominent thing on the ballot. <laughs> so while they're more common in developing countries, they also sometimes appear, symbols appear in advanced industrial democracies as well, or uh, long-standing party systems as well. So this is from Scotland. Um, other ballots, such as Angola, this one from Angola, you don't have any party affiliation, but you have a picture of the candidate. Uh, this is also the case in the, ca the, the country that I'm looking at in this research, Uganda. Until the 2005 elections, there were no party symbols or party names on the ballot. It was a non, no party system, and you only had the candidate's pictures on the ballot. And in a lot of places, you get the full <laughs> panoply there of <laughs> colors and symbols and pictures. So why put these Pizza, this, these identifiers, these additional bits of information on ballots, and in particular, why put visual cues, pictures, photos, symbols? The main rationale for doing this is that they facilitate autonomous and correct voting by, particularly for those people who lack political information and experience and education. When I say autonomous voting, um, I use that word because in a lot of places, you can bring in somebody with you into a voting booth to mark the ballot with you if you are illiterate, but there's concerns about whether or not that additional person might be influencing your vote, right? So, so we want not just correct voting, but that you could do it yourself, that, that an illiterate, illiterate individual could go into the boat, voting booth by themselves and mark their own ballot in the way that they want. And this sort of view is promoted by the ACE Network is one of the premier electoral advising um, agent or agency organizations. Um, they run this uh, thing called the Election uh, Encyclopedia or something like that. Um, and they uh, argue in their section of their uh, website where they talk about electoral design and they're advising uh, people writing elections on how to design their ballots. They say, in all environments, the inclusion of party symbols on the ballot will help voters. In less literate societies, candidate or party leader photographs are useful. So they come out with a very strong recommendation in favor of using these things, um, especially in places where uh, there's an a illiterate society. Um, these guys, however, Reynolds and Steenberger, um, Bergen, they take a look at data about um, which countries have these pictures or party symbols on their ballot and the spoiled ballots in those places um, and not in those places, and they find that there's no relationship between the amount of spoiled ballots, whether or not you include these things. So to the degree we have evidence, it doesn't necessarily support this very strong recommendation. Um, but we're going to look at that further. So that's the rationale for why to include it. So again, the rationale here is that People will be exposed to the images of the candidates during the campaign. Here we have a mobile uh, <laughs> billboard. Um, and the, also to the party symbol, in this case, the yellow bus. And so people will be familiar with the, these uh, visual markers of the candidate that they want to vote to, for, for. And when they see those on the ballot, they'll be sure to mark the candidate that they really want to vote for instead of one L, another one, or instead of refraining from voting altogether. But there are also costs of using identifiers. Um, literally costs, so it's much more expensive to produce a ballot that has pictures and party symbols, especially if you do them in color. Um, often in places in Africa, they have to send the ballots outside of the country to get them printed because they don't have the capacity to do these kinds of printing at mass scale. Um, and so that adds a whole degree of complexity to uh, this, you cannot change who's on the ballot last minute. Um, so there's a whole bunch of complications and costs that come along with this. Um, and in addition, uh, it's a little ironic that ACE comes out so strongly in favor of this because their other number one recommendation on designing a ballot is keep it simple. But the more complex it is, uh, the more likely you are to generate 
problems and mistakes. In addition to just sort of the rationale and the costs, uh, my co-authors and myself think that there might be an additional um, effect of including these things on the ballot. Not just whether you mark the ballot, but they might influence voters um, in specific ways. So that people might actually vote differently because of a symbol than if the symbol wasn't there. And then a sort of extreme example of what we mean by this, um, that the, the symbol itself could cause you to vote in a certain way as opposed to uh, the, the help you just identify the candidate. Here's a voter from Kampala for their referendum that was quoted in the Daily Monitor newspaper as saying, um, so, sorry, the referendum had a symbol of the tree and a symbol of the house for the two different positions. So he said, you need a tree to build a house, so I choose the tree. Um, it is the tree from which we get fruits, like guava jackfruit, and all foods come from the tree. When it rains, you can also go under a tree. The house can easily collapse while the food will be there forever. So this voter literally chose based on the symbols. Um, it's a, as I said, I think it's an extreme sort of version of what we're talking about here. Um, I don't think this is widespread that people actually interpret these symbols and mark them literally. But I think it does illustrate um, what we're trying to talk about more generally, which might, that there might be ways in which the symbols or the pictures themselves influence people to vote in ways that they might not otherwise. Um, often in much more subtle and less sort of uh, direct ways than what we see here, but, but the same kind of understanding there. At this point, we sort of uh, backed up and said, okay, what's lit written in the literature here about these uh, images on ballots and what should we expect? Um, and actually, there's very little written about these things on ballots. So there's the one uh, paper that I've already talked about by Reynolds. There's another one that looks at um, using pictures on uh, ballots in a local, very, very local neighborhood level councils in Britain, um, and that's it. So we had to draw on some other literature to try and think about what it is that, how, wh what ways might these things be uh, affecting people. So one thing we did was looked at um, a literature that compares judicial elections in the United States in some places that have party symbols and other places that don't. So they compare within the United, looking within the United States at partisan elections versus nonpartisan elections. Um, and they find that uh, party symbols increase, or I should say party names more than party symbols, but party identifiers increase participation, especially among poor and less educated voters. And this is true not only in getting people to polls, but it's also in terms of getting them to mark the ballots once they're at the polls. So people might turn out to vote for president, but whether or not they mark the rest of the, the uh, candidates on the ballot has a lot to do with whether or not they see party names um, there as well. So it's said to increase the, the participation of uh, poor and less educated. Also, we have reasons to believe that it might affect uh, vote outcomes can, uh, by priming related to party. So the same literature um, and some others sort of says that these party cues shape the way party sh cues shape, they, they prime party, make people think about party, and that then plays into their decision-making calculus. And that candidate appearance might also have effects. Um, and in particular, there's a fairly large literature now um, that shows that attractive people tend to get elected more often than non-attractive people. <laughs> Um, and that's true uh, in about, I think probably now these studies have been done in maybe a dozen or more countries. Um, and these are not looking at ballot pictures, but that can't, people are exposed to images during the course of the campaign, and they're more likely to vote for attractive people, holding a host of other things constant. So if we look at the pictures that appear on the ballot, um, one might say, gee, some of these are more attractive than others. So they might win votes uh, by virtue of having their picture there right in front of you as you're going to vote. Um, you might be swayed unconsciously, perhaps, towards voting for people who look a little nicer. It's also true that there's, this literature has also showed that these, might, that these can have effect on uh, ethnic considerations. So people tend to vote for candidates that are uh, presumed to be high status, and that can be uh, by virtue of their phenotype, their ethnic uh, characteristics. It can be by virtue of perhaps gender or age or other things. So the, the candidate's appearance itself 
might shift your vote towards uh, voting for a young, attractive person who looks just like you, um, as opposed to one that's based on other considerations. We might expect larger effect for pictures than words. There's a literature out there, um, prior uh, being sort of the foremost in this, saying that uh, people have visual memories that are different from written memory, so that uh, they respond differently to pictures of people than they do to names of people. And uh, that these should be, especially we might expect them to be particularly relevant in developing democracies or low information settings where people have uh, less sources of information about the candidates, perhaps less formed opinions about the candidates. And so we might get some more information, these kinds of cues might be more influential. Um, from this sort of background literature, we've developed a set of hypotheses. This is a subsection of them. But we think that candidate photos and party cues would increase autonomous ballot marking, uh, that they would increase ethnic voting. We think that's true both for the photos, where you might see ethnic, read into the pictures, even if there's no uh, distinct differences between the ethnicities, seeing the picture might cause you to think in ethnic ways, but we also think that's true for party symbol, that parties often have ethnic connotations to them as well. And so seeing that party symbol might prime you to think in, in, in ethnic ways and vote for the party that's most closely aligned with your ethnicity as opposed to the candidate themselves or the candidate characteristics. That candidate photos might cause people to vote for people that are perceived to be more competent, attractive, and high social status and that uh, party cues increase party line voting. So you vote based on party considerations as opposed to other ones. That's the data I'm gonna show you today. Um, just to give you an idea about what we mean by these party identifiers, these are the ones for Uganda, um, the main uh, symbols of the candidates. Um, I should point out that independent candidates also choose symbols in Uganda. They have to choose from a predefined list. So they can think they're things like soccer ball, chair, um, <laughs> radio. Uh, my co-author, we have in the paper there a description of which kinds of symbols are preferred. So for, for uh, parliamentary candidates, especially in urban areas, I think it is they tend to choose things like um, radios and electronic goods and uh, not things like the pot or um, the <laughs> you know, bicycles are more popular than, uh, I forgot, a chair, something like that. But these symbols feature very prominently in the campaigns in Africa. Um, so this yellow bus picture, the shiny modern yellow bus, is at the heading of the NRM website. That's their mask that takes up a about half the page on their website. Um, they actually drive around in the yellow bus um, as they go out campaigning. So it's become a very prominent symbol. And it shows that at least the politicians themselves take these symbols very seriously and think that they are consequential and want to, be, to get the message out that this is their symbol. Uh, you can see the uh, main opposition party in Uganda uh, has the blue key. So there's Basuji with his blue key, and here's one of his big supporters at a rally. Um, so again, these things are prominent. They're prominent on the campaign posters that are around. So you see the key here, and as well, the image of the candidate. So it's very important. Often they are sure to include the same image that they're including on the ballot so that people make that connection. There's some from the NRM. You can see the, the bus symbol here and competing posters. There's one. So he actually doesn't. Does he have a symbol? He has a hose. Yeah, the hose. The hose. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The hose here in the corner. Okay, so how are we going to study this? Well, we can actually go out and manipulate the ballots that these guys are marking in the actual elections, right? Um, and there are problems with trying to compare across countries um, because there are very many different things that are affecting vote outcomes. So what we chose to do is um, an experimental design. What we did is, uh, it turned out to be several days before the election took place, most recently in Uganda. We had fielded a survey. Um, and before we started the survey, we gave these individuals sample ballots to mark. 
And those ballots uh, de were, were different uh, depending on what condition they were randomly assigned to. So I'll walk through that a little bit more. There are, um, there are four races here the president that we look at. The presidential, the MP. On Uganda, they have a women MP position and the district chair. And there were five different ballot types that somebody was randomly assigned to get one of these five. So we can say that because they're randomly assigned to get one of these, they are, uh, the different groups are similar in all respects, on average, based on statistical uh, methods. On average, they're equivalent across a whole host of different things that we might be concerned about. And the one difference that's uh, between these different groups is which ballot, which kind of ballot they got to mark. So the first ballot includes only the name of the candidate. So all of them include the name of the candidate. Um, the first ballot includes no other information. The second one includes the party name and the acronym in addition to the name of the candidate. The third one includes the name and the party symbol. This is the president ballot. This is the MP, and I'm not showing you the other two races. Uh, the fourth one does not include the party identifiers at all, but it includes the picture. And the fifth one includes the full set. So you have the name of the candidate, the party name, the party symbol, and the picture. And this fifth one looks most like the actual ballot that they got to mark three days after we gave them these sample ballots to mark. Um, so these are people marking the ballots in their home um, after being approached by and introduced into this as a survey exercise, a research exercise. So we might be somewhat concerned that this is not the same as marking a ballot in a voting booth. Um, but I would argue it's, it's pretty close to the extent uh, that it's only days before the campaign. So all the campaign, inf I mean, before the election, all the campaign influences and other things that might go into making them uh, have a decision have, we would hope for the most part, already played out. That people don't usually switch two days or three days before an election who they're deciding to vote for if they've already made a decision. Um, and so we, we're hoping that at least uh, this will give us some leverage towards understanding how a real ballot might be affecting uh, their, their vote choice. I can talk a little bit in question and answer if you want about the slight differences between the actual one and our one. How did we select the research site? Um, the first uh, issue was logistical constraints. Um, my co-author, Jeff, was already in the field doing a survey for another project and already had research assistance and data on the constituencies where he was planning to work. And so we wanted to work in those ones or the neighboring ones where we already had some data and uh, uh, logistical help, I should say. Um, so we had these places to choose from. And then we wanted to find an inter-ethnic competition. So we wanted to find a constituency where there were candidates of different ethnicities so that we could test some of those ethnic arguments that we made earlier. Um, this proved surprisingly difficult. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Um, but uh, at, the level, at the level of presidents, obviously, there's inter-ethnic competition um, to the extent that that exists anywhere. But when you're looking at the constituency level, at the MPs, or the women MPs or the, uh, the, the district chairperson, most of them are single ethnicity races. So there's a dominant ethnicity in the area and only candidates of that ethnicity choose to run in the election. So uh, we, and it was a little hard at times to figure out what ethnicities were and who actually was, uh, you know, which races were, but, but at the end of the day, the one uh, that, stuck out as being both an interethnic race and a com potentially competitive race um, was this one in Soroki County. Um, so this is the county. The municipality is not part of this. It's a separate district or county of itself. Um, so we're only looking at the rural areas there. Uh, there's a picture from Soroki County. It's slight, very slightly poorer, less educated, less politically knowledgeable. Um, and less dependent on mass media for uh, information than Uganda as a whole. But it's pretty common. I mean, pretty, sorry. It, it's close to the averages for these things. There, there are two ethnicities in Soroti County. 
One is the Kumam and the other is, is Hesso. They are, I'm told, fairly similar in, in terms of linguistic and cultural practices and whatnot, um, but they are politicized ethnicities. So that was the other thing we, we needed, not just inter-ethnic competition, but ones that were politically meaningful. So this is the distribution of Kumam are primarily located in this part of the county and Atesso are in the others. If we look at the vote um, of Soroti County as a whole in the last election, Basiji did a great job in Soroti County as opposed to the rest of the country. This is the incumbent who won in many other places, um, but this was an opposition stronghold area at that point, less so in the election that we looked at. Much less so. Um, and if we look at the vote share for Basiji, you can see it maps pretty strongly onto that Kumam Ateso divide. If we look at the percent vote for Kumam and the percent vote for Basiji, we get a significant relationship there. Um, the same is true for the candidates for parliament. So you have in the last election, there was this interethnic race. And again, the candidate who is Kumam here, uh, captured more votes there than elsewhere. And again, that's a significant relationship. So we were successful in picking a county where ethnicity was politicized and there, were, there was an a ethnic race. If that's the 2000 candidate, that one disappeared. But in 2011, these three who were the big vote getters remained and another potentially big vote getter added in, he's um, an, the NRM candidate, so he's sure to get at least some of the votes, even though he's new on the scene. Um, and a host of others ran as well, um, many of which were independents, and they varied by ethnicity. So that's the story um, for why we chose that place. All of that is, is somewhat irrelevant for the data I'm gonna show you today, um, but it's uh, relevant for the larger picture of the story why we chose this. Um, we sampled based on the population proportional to size. I'm going to race through this a little bit. We covered most of the county. These are the parishes. The dark orange is where we sampled from. Uh, those were randomly selected. That's where we went. We used a random walk within the uh, village and a KISH grid for selecting members. We come up with a number of uh, hypotheses about the way in which party cues might affect voting. Um, by party cues, we're looking here at both the party symbol and the party name, so together. Um, we're going to focus, because of time, on just three of these. The first one is that, based on the literature, we hypothesize that party cues should be positively related to total votes for m major party candidates. Um, the rationale being here that most people support major parties. If you remind them about what the party is, they're more likely to vote for one of those major parties by virtue of the fact that they are major parties. Um, and major parties for us, and specifically here, is defined as being both NRM and FDC. <coughs> uh, party cues are negatively related to total votes for minor parties. Um, the party cues are negatively related to total votes for independent candidates. So the last one actually is R1, extrapolating the literature doesn't say anything about independence because there aren't independents in a lot of races and advanced industrial democracies where they're looking. Um, but for us, that we thought that was an important one. Um, let me go to that hypothesis first. I'm gonna tell you, uh, this is the comparisons that we did. So we're comparing those people who were randomly assigned to this, get this ballot, with those people who were randomly assigned to get this ballot. So the only difference between these two ballots is the party identifiers. So we're comparing this with this, and we're also gonna compare this one with this one. So again, the only difference between these two is the name and the party, the party name and the party identifiers, um, though they both have pictures as well. Uh, so yellow is without pictures, Green is with pictures, but we should expect the same comparison, that adding on the party identifiers does the same thing in green that it does in yellow. Uh, there are our results, so let me walk you through this. No means they did not get the party identifiers, so they were on this side of the screen in the last figures. Yes means they did get the identifiers, they were on that side of the screen previously, so this is no, this is yes. These 
were votes for major parties from the yellow and the green. These were votes for minor parties from the yellow and the green. And these were votes for independent candidates from the yellow and the green. Um, the bar is the mean and the black lines are the 95% confidence interval. Um, up at the top, you have the difference between the means for those who didn't get party cues and those that did. So, and the stars indicate whether or not they're statistically significant. So if you were randomly assigned to get a party queue, you were 0.29, this is on a scale of three, more likely to vote for a major party. So just being assigned to that ballot made you more likely to vote for either NRM or FDC. Um, and uh, if we look at those two parties, it, there's no trade-off between them. They both gain. So not, this, not significantly for NRM, but the estimates are positive for both. Um, <coughs> no effect on mi for minor parties, no sig statistically significant effect. Um, it may be that we have a floor effect here. So we would expect that the yes queue would drop you down, but they were so low to begin with, it's hard to drop from nothing. So that might be what's going on there. Um, and for independence, we get a statistically significant effect in the negative direction. So what's happening here is that when people see party queues, they stop voting for independence, and they start instead voting for major parties. That's the numbers. And we find support for the major party hypothesis and the independent hypothesis, but not for the, the minor party one. OK, going on to the next hypothesis I'm covering here today. It's that party queues made straight ticket voting more likely. So the idea here is if you see a party queue, you're going to vote for all of those four races for the same party across all four, um, more so than if you hadn't seen those party queues. And we do find that effect um, as statistically significant. And essentially, a little more investigation shows that what's happening here is people aren't changing their presidential vote at all. They're changing their vote for the MP, the women MP, and the, uh, the counselor. So they're adjusting the down, what we call down ticket uh, votes to match the one of their presidential choice. That's the numbers, support for that hypothesis. And finally, the last one is that um, we expected that adding uh, the party, if you just add the party name, you get less of effect than if you add the symbol onto the party name. So p symbols we thought would be more influential than just the name, or, or than adding the party name. So what we're doing here is saying, what's the difference of going from the name of the, sorry, from nothing to the written name of the party, and compare the extra boost you get from that to, say, here. So in this case, they already see the name of the party, but do they get an extra boost when you add in the symbol. And we thought that you'd get more of a difference from this one than you would from the previous one. And you do, um, but not necessarily statistically so. So the blue, again, is the effect of just adding on the name. The red is the effect of adding the symbol once you have the name. So blue, the red is the difference at the top there is larger than the difference for the blue. Um, and the effect on in voting for independence, you get a bigger drop in the red than you do with the blue, but only this one is a statistically significant difference. Um, and I'd love help with this one. So we're still trying to puzzle out what exactly it is. Um, it might be that uh, the different portions of the population are affected differently by these different cues, so that um, literate people might be affected by the name, but illiterate people are affected by the symbol. Our very, very, very initial look at that doesn't seem to be the case, but we're still kind of uh, trying to suss that out. Um, but for the most part, our, our hypothesis received some support, meaning that we did expect a bigger effect here, and it seems to be going in that direction, but we don't have statistical power to really be able to, or the statistical uh, significance we would like to be confident about that effect. So question marks. Um, that's the full list of hypotheses. I can come back to that, but I do want to conclude. I should have emphasized this more in the beginning, but party politics are only five years old in Uganda at the time that we did this experiment. 
Um, and only five years after the introduction of multi-party elections, party coups significantly affect voting in Uganda. So very, very new onto parties, uh, party uh, politics and parties on the ballot. And parties are having this pretty large effect on vote outcome. So they're, a, in a sense, affecting one in 10 voters. They're making them switch their votes. Um, and that these effects of party coups in Uganda are pretty much consistent with effects that we found in wealthy and established party systems. So they look a lot like party effects elsewhere in the world. And in some ways, that should give us sort of comfort. Um, but in other ways, it's actually really challenging. So the thing is, is that the large effects in Uganda really challenged the conventional view about why parties matter to people. So the standard view here is that parties matter, that party cues influence either attitudes or votes because they draw on long established identities that have been formed over the course of your lifetime as you are socialized into a system. On the one hand, they prime these kinds of identities and make you vote in those ways. Or because they provide you information either about the policies of the candidates or about the performance of those candidates. So the notion is, is that parties matter because either they've been around for a long time and people hold them as identities or because they're informative about policies or performance. Um, and this should lead us to believe that party effects should be much stronger in established party systems, long-standing party systems, than they are in new ones. And yet the size of the effects that we're getting from Uganda are similar in size to those that are found in uh, advanced industrial democracies of Europe, for the most part. Um, and they're slightly less than the United States, but the United States is a bit of an outlier. But they're much stronger than the effects of party cues in places where we've done the research. There's not that much that people have done this outside of advanced industrial democracies, but they're stronger than Mexico, Canada, um, uh, Russia, Poland, I think Ukraine is in that group as well. So they're stronger than the other new parties out there. And the existing literature, to the extent that there is evidence, has said that these things are weaker in new party systems, and yet Uganda seems to be not falling in line with that. So why? This is the big puzzle I said that at the beginning that I, there's the, the, I need help with. <laughs> um, so why are they so uh, strong in Uganda? I'm going to give you a provisional answer um, and tell you uh, what tests we're going to do to try and figure this out, and then maybe you can help me as well. Um, the provisional answer is that party cues signal candidate connections to patronage networks rather than providing them information about policy positions. So the argument here is, remember, when we found no effects of people switching from one party to another party. What we found was people switching from independent candidates to a major party. And what we're positing is that people are mistaking these independent candidates as being members of parties when they're no longer. Um, many of these independent candidates are thought to be party stalwarts. They ran on party tickets in the past, um, or they've been entrenched members of the party apparatus in the past. And for one reason or another, either they were, in Uganda terms, decampaigned by the major parties, or they were not chosen to <laughs> run in this particular election, they've decided to run under the independent banner rather than under the candidate, uh, the party banner. And so voters are confused. They think that these independents are party members, and they're voting for what they think is a party member, but instead they're voting for independents. When you provide them the information about who is actually running under the party banner, they choose that person. Um, and so instead of the conventional view, again, is that party cues help voters to vote policy positions, vote with identities that matter to them, or vote based on the performance of the candidates. And we're saying that in Africa, where parties, for the most part, in Uganda, don't distinguish themselves on poly policy positions, that primarily what's going on here is you're not helping people to vote um, in ways that we might want them to vote. Instead, you're helping them to vote for, patron, for the person who's most likely to deliver the goods. That's our hypothesis. To test that, um, we want to see, we asked later in this, after we gave them the ballot, we asked later on them to tell us what they thought the party was of each of the candidates. So we can look at those people who didn't get the party cues and see if they're misidentifying um, these uh, independents as being party members and if they're doing that more in the control condition, in the conditions without party cues than with them. 
Um, we can also see whether or not, uh, if you misidentify an uh, a candidate, an independent as being from a party, are you more likely to vote for, a, for that independent? And we can also test um, whether or not respondents in the no party conditions are more likely to vote for independents that are associated with their presidential vote. So it's, is it the case that uh, the guy who's most thought of by everybody is being the NRM guy, even though he's really an independent, if I voted for Museveni, am I more likely to vote for that independent as opposed to other independents? So that's the plan. Um, let me say there's an, another um, provisional answer, which is that, uh, that these things are so important because these voters have absolutely no idea who they want to vote for at all. There's no information on these candidates, and therefore they're voting. Any little bit of information is, is very important. Um, and so we could, we're going to play a little bit around looking at educated uh, knowledgeable uh, respondents versus less knowledgeable one. Um, but I, I think it's gonna be this one. <laughs> so what does this mean for, um, for consequences? And here I could also use a lot of help. So um, do party cues on the ballot help or harm democratic development? Um, so on the one hand, we say that they could have uh, harmful effects. The first is that uh, to the extent, as I just sort of mentioned, it's to the extent that parties aren't differentiating along policy lines, and people are voting not, when they see the party, they're voting not on policy issues or on performance issues, but instead on this patronage, uh, trying to get the guy who's tied into patronage, that could be harmful. Um, it's also true that we find a significant switch to straight ticket voting, so you're less likely to get candidates um, for in parliament, in your council, etc that are different from the guy running the show. In other words, whoever is winning for the presidential uh, race is also going to influence which parties you're voting for down the line um, or who you're voting for down the line. And so there's going to be less sort of uh, checks and balances. Um, divided government, uh, as Kristen has informed me, is extremely rare in Africa, and this makes it even more unlikely. On the other hand, these party cues could help democratic development by uh, helping to facilitate party discipline and party institutionalization. So it basically allows the party to be more sure that the guy that they choose to run in the election is the one that's going to win. So if these party cues are on the ballot, the actual candidate that's running under the party banner is more likely to win than independents who are, in many cases, challenging the party apparatus. And so this might help to get more uh, party uh, discipline and strength in party institutionalization. Um, there's a lot of literature saying that's good for democratic development. Um, I think that my personal view is it's, it's good only to the extent that parties take policy positions rather than pat that rather than primarily being patronage operations. So I'm, I guess I'm I fall probably more in the one than in the two. Um, but it, I think it really depends on what kind of policy you're in and what the major ills of that quality are, whether or not these things would help or harm you. So sorry I went on. <laughs> uh, if you're in a situation in which politics aren't local, and in fact, people that you're electing at, at this level really have no discretion, that all the effective decisions, no, you know, notably for pork barrel, are going to be decided at the party level rather than at the individual level, then you'll take a, a really different yeah. So that's one question. And okay. then the other question is, um, you know, what's striking in the way that you describe this is as if the voters really don't know the different candidates. And so they go into the voting booth basically not knowing the candidates, and then they need all these cues, right? But it, wouldn't that be really affected by the size of the district? So if you're in a relatively small district, there's a much greater chance that you've actually met uh, the candidate. Or I would put it differently and say, you're much more likely to know the candidate of the major party because the party, the, the major parties are likelier to get better candidates, in mm -hmm. effect, right? Uh, or, and by better, I mean big men who have a, a profile in, the, in the, the district that maybe the lesser parties can't get. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, right. So, and I think on both accounts, I kind of, well, I agree with you. Um, I guess I'm a, a, a little bit wondering about what the implications are for this. So, so I, I think you're right that people are trying to figure out who to vote for that's going to mm -hmm. 
<laughs> either affect policies or deliver the goods. Either one, um, if power is, is there in the presidency, then you want to either signal that you're all out for the guy who's got to win the presidency, or um, you want to uh, actually provide him with additional support from your area so that that, uh, that will happen. Um, so that's, that's correct. Um, I guess I'm wondering a little bit, so what are, what are the implications of that for what we find? I mean, in, in some senses, uh, the findings are is that, that these party identifiers help voters to do that, I guess, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, I'm arguing against that. I'm no, saying, no, yeah, no, no that, it, that is what it, I think, I think you're right. I think that's what these are doing. Um, but I think that that challenges this notion, the conventional view that party cues help voters to make up their minds about the individual candidates that they're voting for and what their policy positions are going to be. So that's that's the sort of literature that we're drawing on, and I'm saying no, I, I don't think that's what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and indeed, if yeah, so we shouldn't find those strong effects if it was the former, if, if it was the conventional view, but we do. So I think you're right. Um, the second one is that. Um, so if you were right and people knew these candidates really well, then we should find no effects in this experiment. And yet we do, and they're big. So, and in some senses, most of the literature on party cues um, happens early on in the campaign when people don't yet know the, the candidates and these are, you're providing them with information. And yet here we're literally two, three days before the election and we're having these huge effects. So, so I, again, if they, they, there must be something going on here. So it could not, it's possible it's not new information, but you're priming them to think about the information they already know to prioritize the salience of some issues and not others. How, how big a district is it? Mean, it's pretty small. Um, I don't know the number, but it's, it's a pretty small and rural, I mean, it's, it, candidates are not well known to the extent that it's very rural and it's hard for candidates to get around all the time, but it's, they're pretty small and they've been running, many of these candidates have been running for several elections now. So it's puzzling. <laughs> um, but something's going on and I, I, think, I think you might be right. It's not necessarily new information, but you might just be reminding them, oh, this is, remember, this is not the NRM guy, this one is now. So it might be not new information, but that you're making that issue more salient. Or it might be that I really liked Vincent um, and I know him and he's a good guy, um, but when I see that party symbol in front of me, I'm reminded, oh yeah, there's more at stake than just Vincent here. I need to vote with my party or with the party I think is gonna win, essentially is what we're saying. Good. It seems that uh, these cues, <coughs> us, um, especially the um, logos, are more of a way to um, finding a problem of like the like, <coughs> actual literacy. Um, but in logistics example, do you think this might actually be reinforcing <coughs> that problem where it creates an incentive for parties to more push a commercial campaign rather than the actual like program yeah. campaign? I mean, uh, can you speak more to <laughs> Because personally, um, I see this more as like a band-aid and not an actual solution. Can you speak more? Interesting. So I do not think that um, individuals are deciding whether or not to try and become literate based on whether or not they can read a ballot. Um, so I don't think it's affecting illiteracy itself. But whether or not it's affecting the campaigns that, um, that candidates run. So there I actually, there's, there's pretty strong anecdotal evidence that it is. Um, so uh, Museveni is very illustrative here. Um, that hat that he wears, um, is in his campaign, in his ballot picture, and the first time he wore it, the opposition complained that, hey, that's against the electoral rules, you're not allowed to wear headgear, and yet he has <laughs> worn it and had it in his picture on the ballot ever since they s he started doing this, and he wears the exact same hat, and I dare say the same suit, <laughs> everywhere he goes to campaign, exactly to play upon this image. Um, he did a set of robocalls in the day before the election where the message was vote for the guy with the hat. Um, and he's been known to do that a lot. So he's definitely playing on the use of this image um, to try and get out the message to, to vote for him. 
Um, there's anecdotal evidence that, that people are riffing off, and these things are so prevalent in campaigns. I mean, I'm a little surprised that political scientists haven't studied this earlier because they are really ubiquitous in campaigns, these symbols. Um, so people pay attention to these. It's another question to ask whether or not that supplants a higher level of discussion about policy, et cetera. So I think it could enhance that. Um, my policies <coughs> are uh, to um, spend more money on agriculture and whatever, and if you want to be sure to vote for me because you care about farming, you know, you care about farming subsidies, vote for the guy with the hat or vote for the bus. So I think it could be a, an addition to a policy-based kind of um, campaigning and voting, but it could also be the opposite, right? It could be, I'm going to bring a road vote for the guy with the hat. So I'm, I'm not sure it displaces it in that way. Actually, an interesting comparison would be the symbols that were used during the one-party elections, during the, the era of one party. Yeah, did they That's change the when they... The for example, in my country, the no vote was always represented by a hyena. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is like somebody deceptive. So obviously... Can, can I say one more thing about this? The other really puzzling thing from Uganda is that not only that they have these strong effects, but the effects are for the newest parties. So the FTC gets the biggest effect, and they're six years old or seven years old now. Um, and NRM gets the next biggest effect. And the parties that have been around since the 60s and 70s doesn't affect them. So again, this notion that it's long-standing partisanship or ideas about what these parties mean doesn't seem to hold up within the case as well as across cases. You had mentioned, I think it was in Uganda, that if you weren't with a major party, there was like a preset list of images that you can pick from. So what I'm wondering is if if you took out uh, you know the symbols for the major parties and those candidates, with the limited amount of information that's available on each of the independent candidates, would the images have a much stronger <coughs> impact? And like your who decides which image you get to select and what the meaning of that is. So would it have a stronger effect? Yeah, choosing from a preset list is for the independent candidates only. So minor parties get to pick their own party symbol, okay. and they're using, I think, and I think they're using the same ones. I should check whether they're using the same ones they used in the '60s and '70s or not. Okay. Um, but it's the independent candidates that are said. Here's a menu, and it's basically a first come, f first serve. So yeah. when you get the number of uh, signatories and do the paperwork that you need to to get your thing, you then get to choose your symbol. Um, there's, I'm, I'm looking around for an opportunity to study whether or not symbols themselves can drive outcomes. Um, and I think that they do. I think actually people, not only do candidates tend to choose more one symbol more than another, I think probably voters respond to these symbols potentially also. Um, but it's hard because because it's a timing issue, those who are more established get to choose their symbol first, so it's hard to say whether or not it's be that You're symbol right. is having more effect because uh, the stronger candidate chose it. Well, I had um, something that I thought of regarding a previous speaker, yeah. in series, which is from the Afrobarometer. Yeah. He was they were looking at legislative strength, right, development, right? But in the course of doing that, they had um, characteristics or factors that led people to vote for their MP. And patronage was way, way, way ahead of policy. So I just thought that feeds into to these things. Um, yeah. That if if that's true across lots of countries in Africa, older, newer democracies, it's gonna come out in your example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think yeah. that's why we have that provisional answer is because the the research tends to show that people care about Patronage and what patronage might. Will be I was going to say patronage. Actually, if if I know the re the work that you're referring to, um, patronage could be a misnomer there because people care about um, delivery of goods and services. Oh, goods and services to them. Yeah, actually, right. patronage. So, is the so that can be patronage or it cannot it be cannot. patronage, but they care yeah. about delivery and, of services. And the other the question, which is informational, 
when there weren't elections and Museveni was just, did he still drive around in the yellow bus and wear a hat? <laughs> no. Pre no, the, it's no. not. The uh, bus, I believe, that's a good question. When did the bus come? <laughs> um, <laughs> Hmm, that's a good question. Because that could, re you know, it could pre-establish. I, I want to say maybe, I don't think it was there during the CA elections, at least I don't remember hearing any reference to it when I was doing stuff, which was an election where they didn't have party symbols. I think it might have been 2000 that the bus came, I'm not sure. But that would still be before, before the symbol was on the thing, yeah. Where are we at in terms of term limits, and will the man in the hat, you know, be able to reign forever? Yes. <laughs> um, he successfully mounted a campaign to abolish term limits, and so he is no longer bound by that constraint. Um, did you guys control or look at um, the level of like, I or um, access and exposure they had to these visual? Like the symbols and all of that, because you mentioned that it was in a rural area and didn't sample the main yeah. So um, I'm wondering the level of marketing and sort of campaigning that went on in your site here. So I can only tell you a little bit indirectly. Um, these parties are, party symbols are very well known. Um, so we asked on the survey after they marked the ballot again, um, we asked them, we showed them the party, a thing of party symbols and said, you know, tell me what the party is. and. Uh, I think something like, uh, it's in the paper, but it was somewhere in the 80s, high 80s, got the FDC and the NRM right, and then well, how about the, some of the, minor the minor parties with much less, um, but still a fair amount. And even people who said that they can't read, they couldn't read the ballot, we had a question about did you have trouble reading the ballot we just gave you or not. Um, people who couldn't read the ballot um, were still correctly reporting the, the uh, party based on the party symbol. Um, so, so these, it seems, I mean, we, I think we can say with confidence that people do know these party symbols. So the campaigns have been successful in pushing out there, this is our symbol and, and people can correctly do that. Much more again for those major parties than for the minor parties. So I think we should conclude our discussion here and thank our speakers very, very much for